Welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch, got to meet people. Um, I feel like this morning we talked about a bunch of major problems um, that, have, that have solutions, but they are problems. Um, and this first panel this afternoon is going to look at some of the new and emerging ways to deal with these problems, some of the voices that are emerging onto the scene, how the sort of voices that we're used to and the uh, political and social alignments that we're used to might be changing. Um, so uh, first, as you can see in your program, we're going to welcome Juma to the stage. Um, but before I do that, he's got a video. Let's listen. <laughs> I had a dream of the future yesterday. I swear if you could see it, it would take your breath away. We could take things and make them into great things. Visualize creations to improve our lives. We had open ears. We had open eyes. We could share ideas with an open mind. We could coexist and we can co-design. Speak different tongues and still work as one. And we never gave up till the work was done. The vibe was worldwide, excluding none. No matter where you're from, you can learn and build. This dream was so real, I woke up to feel like I can't make a difference right where I am. Show my community that I care Build something real, be an engineer Don't over there, so on the way back there Swap minds and build things where we stand Show our community that we care Don't over there, so on the way back here You can do it too, be an engineer We share this vibe together No matter where you come from Let's work to make it better Engineer our tomorrow I had a dream of the future yesterday I swear if you could see it, it would take your breath away We can make neighborhoods better and it wasn't a miracle Just creativity and simple materials Put together to make something useful and clever From the farthest and nearest Engineering wasn't foreign to hearing It was everyday life and common experience We all shared it all across the globe We were not alone, we were all united And all invited to learn from each other And help one another to grow more Move toward a global future I can't make a difference right now. I swear if you could see it, it would take your breath away Anyone, anywhere could be an engineer You could make creations or make it a career I swear this dream was real and it's not so far Cause the future's here and the choice is ours We can all get on if we get involved If we all pick up with tomorrow cars And we give up never, do whatever, whenever We can multiply eyes till we get together We can start a revolution and spark solutions And let imagination become our two kids I can't make a difference right where I am Show my community that I can Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to share a few thoughts and some ideas on engaging uh, the teen and tween segments of Generation Z. But before I do, I'll share a little bit of my backstory and what led me to working with, with uh, young people. Because I think it's some relevant connections to what we're going to talk about. So my journey in youth work began in hip hop. And my relationship with hip hop began with media. That is, me spending wholly inappropriate amounts of time watching rap videos every day after school as a kid. Now, I eventually caught the bug and wrote my first song when I was in high school. And from there, I was hooked. You see, I wasn't into a lot of the extracurricular activities, if you will, that a lot of my peers were into. Uh, I was terrible at all sports. I mean, I always tell people, I am the most unathletic black man you will ever meet. 
I mean, kids used to skip class to go to gym. I used to skip gym to go to art and music class. So rap music became my best friend. It led me on a far scump like life ride that involved everything from dropping out of college to dropping back in to performing in full body Spider-Man costumes, being at least 60 pounds overweight at the time, to rubbing elbows with a few fancy folks, and to playing my music in front of thousands, and sometimes just the bartender. But the greatest gift that hip hop offered me was the opportunity to connect with youth in my community and beyond. Because in that, I discovered a passion for engaging and empowering young people that has even eclipsed my love for music in a lot of ways. You see, how can I put this? I'll say this. <clears throat> it was from hip hop that I was able to extract and adapt three key principles for engaging youth that guide and anchor my work to this day. I call them the ABCs of engaging Generation Z, and they are to be authentic, to be bold, and to be curious. You see, creative hooks are really important in engaging youth audiences, but if I can put this in fishing terms, metaphorically, I would say creative hooks are great, but being a wise fisherman is everything. And wise fishing, when it comes to youth engagement, has to be grounded in authenticity, authenticity, boldness, and curiosity. Why? Because we live in a mass media clutter environment, a 24-7, 365 rat race for attention that knows no boundaries or limits in our young people's lives. You see, teenagers spend nine hours per day with entertainment media alone, being exposed to all manner of voices and influences. Simply put, the noise barrier between our messages and the youth audiences that we want to connect with grows thicker and wider by the minute. So what does it mean to be authentic, bold, and curious, and how do we leverage these characteristics to support our creative executions and break through the noise barrier and reach the young people that we'd like to reach? I'll give you guys a crash course on each. So authenticity is a thing right now in modern mainstream culture, but it's been a thing in hip hop since day one. And part of the reason why rap music has been such a driving force in youth culture over the years. In fact, this past July, Forbes just reported that hip hop is officially the number one music genre for the first time in recorded history based on data from Nielsen's annual report on music and streaming sales. Now, authenticity is about communicating from the core of who you are and the core of your why. Authenticity, it's about, it's the best way to say this, it's about living out your individual or organizational truth, right? Authenticity calls us out of our safe comfort zones and into the deeper waters of transparency and vulnerability. And if I can revert back to my fishing analogy, I would say that casting your creative hooks in deeper waters can increase your chances of catching more fish. So while you're authentically fishing, don't forget to be bold. Boldness is about being unafraid to break rules of conformity. Boldness is less concerned with the confines of a particular shape or mold or structure. Boldness, boldness excuse me, is more concerned with energy signature or vibe. Anything we do with respect to connecting with youth audiences today has to have a cool vibe. Back in the day, Jesse Jackson would say, keep hope alive. It's a terrible Jesse Jackson. <laughs> These days, we keep the hope alive, but I'm saying, let's keep the vibe alive, y'all. And when you're keeping the vibe alive, don't forget to be curious. You see, the most important punctuation known to human communication is the question mark, because questions can lead us to information, information can lead us to knowledge, knowledge can lead to empowerment, and power can affect change. Being curious about what's important to young people, their needs, their wants, their anxieties, 
first and above all else is key, or some would say a major key. My wholehearted belief is that the only time we lose in life is when we stop being curious. And that also includes our efforts in engaging young people. At the end of the day, as someone who works to empower youth, I recognize and embrace that I am in the business of question marks and exclamation points. And guess what? If you have any desire to, enga to engage, excuse me, today's youth audiences, you are too, bottom line. Once we embrace that, once authenticity, boldness, and curiosity become part of our creative DNA, then that rips the lid off of the possibilities, right? At that point, we can imagine wild and cool campaigns that leverage Snapchat, Instagram, Musical.ly, and all the social media platforms that are hot for youth right now. We can use video, film, gaming, AR, VR, and other new technologies. And we can use my favorite medium and perhaps one of the most effective in engaging youth, music. In my, uh, in my practice with the message, we deploy authenticity, boldness, and curiosity in different ways to teach media literacy, something that has historically been a tough sell outside of academic and activist circles. One way we do this is through live music. So we have a program called Message Tour, which is a concert that features a live music show followed by an inspirational talk about the importance of critical thinking and decision making in digital culture. Last year, we ran a message tour for a private school in Maine for about 250 to 300 middle and high school students. I'll show you guys a short video of what happened and I'll talk about some of the results. <laughs> This being our flagship engagement program, the, its primary objective is to raise awareness and excitement around critical thinking and considering the ways media can affect our lives. We were able to get feedback from a survey sample of attendees and these were some of the data that we got back. Overall, we were able to move the needle in the right direction in terms of uh, beliefs and awareness around the way media can influence and affect our lives. But what struck me most from that event was this sixth grade student who had come up to me after the talk and he shook my hand and jokingly said, you should run for president. I'm like, right on man, bad idea, but right on, I appreciate it. The next day, per usual, I posted a pic from the event on Instagram and gave the school a shout out. The same young man sent me a direct message and what he said really, really struck me because it spoke to the heart of my why in a really direct way. So this is our entire exchange. I'll direct your attention to the top. He said, it was awesome. I told my friends to follow you. Thanks so much, it was great. It proves you don't have to be weird and uncool to tell people to be nice and kind, right? So if I can borrow my man's words here, I would say, you don't have to be weird and uncool in your youth engagement efforts. You can be authentic, bold, and curious. Happy fishing, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Juma. Um, I'm going to not insert a question here because we've got four people on this panel and I want to save time at the end. Um, next up, we're going to have Nick, uh, who's the executive director of the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. In the geographic, diver we've got a lot of geographic diversity on this panel. Coming in from South Dakota, Nick, take it away. Uh, before we get started, we're actually going to show a short video.
If you're going to find resiliency on this planet, you're going to find it amongst indigenous people. It's part of our lived experience. There is a line drawn in the sand. It's about humanity's ability to live on this earth. Over 100 years ago, where I sit here today, praise yours, we had a way humble, a dream. Then there's a time when uh, all the people would unite under the sacred tree. Standing Rock represented our people coming together and rising up. We responded with prayer and action. The world woke up to these issues. The world is a different place today because of the actions we have collectively taken. The decisions we make right now not only decide what the next seven generations are going to look like, we're deciding if there's going to be a next seven generations. And our answer is yes, there is. And we're gonna fight to make that happen. We want to share that with the world. What we're doing here at Thunder Valley is creating an idea of what is possible. Reconnecting to our food source, reconnecting to our energy source, reconnecting to our language and culture. We're fighting and building for our future, and by that creating opportunities that are a reflection of our people, our spirituality, and our identity. In the process of doing this, we're reclaiming our power. We have to continue to fight on the front lines and stop these companies while building the communities of tomorrow. My name is Nick Tilson. I greet you in Lakota this morning, or this afternoon, still morning in South Dakota. Uh, I'm a father of four children, um, and I have two of my boys with me in the back there, Aiden and Josea. Um, it is their, their future and their sister's future that I fight for. Um, I come from the Oglala Lakota Nation, the, the people of the Great Plains people of the buffalo. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't that long ago, actually, that we actually lived a life, a sustainable lifestyle that was built on an economy that was focused around a symbiotic relationship between the buffalo, the earth. So there wasn't separation between jobs, economy, climate. Those things were inter interconnected. Um, even in Lakota, the things that we say at the beginning and end of prayers, we say madakoyase which literally means that we are all related and that all things are related. And um, some of the notable histories of people that have come from of Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, some of these names, some of the few, only few names that you've actually heard in history books is some of the names of the people that I come from. Um, the impact of Manifest Destiny on indigenous people has been uh, detrimental and it wasn't just an impact of ideological differences it was about an impact on different what our relationships to different resources were our relationship to the environment um, Buffalo was once something that was most sacred to us it because it provided our health it provided our housing it provided our economy and it provided a means of our culture um, there's a time in history that Buffalo um, where, where entire mass herds of buffalo were, were murdered just for their tongues because they were a delicacy here on the East Coast during that time. This whole relationship with land, we actually, like, I, I was, whenever I say our land, it's weird to me because it's like, when I say our land, I mean our land, our collective land, because this whole idea that we were stewards um, of land was how we viewed it. We weren't owners of property. We were stewards of land. And this, you know, this whole period of time during the Industrial Revolution when America was becoming the richest, most powerful country in the world, Indian people were starving. By this time, by the time the Industrial Revolution hit, almost 60 million buffalo had already been eradicated and almost 15 million indigenous people. And um, so, so sort of like this time in history in which you know, America was becoming the richest, most powerful country in the world, we were experiencing huge amounts of hardship and demise. And it was uh, during that same period of time, there was, there was a big assault on our identity, which still continues to affect us today. 
Um, it wasn't enough to take our land, to take our resources, to remove us, imprison us, but it was thought progressive at the time to assimilate the American Indian into, into mainstream society. It was a whole philosophy that was based on kill the, um, kill the Indian and save the man. You know, assimilate children, take them out of, um, take them out of our, um, our, our, our multi-generational homes, put them into boarding schools, make us cut our hair. And then in the 60s and 70s, you had the rise of the American Indian movement that made a huge stand and made it, you know, made it one, be okay to be Indian. Also, that it, we should be celebrating our diversity as a country, stand up for what we, uh, stand, stand up for what we believe in as in indigenous people. And so I, I was a generation that got to grow up, um, learn, growing up in our ceremonies, at a time when our ceremonies weren't outlawed, at a time where it was being, pr you know, we were proud to be Lakota. Um, today, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation is located in Western South Dakota. There's about 30,000 of us living there. It's about 50 by 90 miles. It's roughly the size of Delaware. Um, it's also ground zero for poverty in America. And it has been ground zero for poverty in America for about the last 150 years. It has the lowest life expectancy in the entire Western Hemisphere with the exception of Haiti. So the impacts of historical trauma on our community is real. In fact, seven of the 11 poorest communities in all of America are in South Dakota and they're all Indian reservations. There's some correlation there. Um, the movement that I was a part of and grew out of was this movement of reconnecting young people to culture, to spirituality, and to identity, and giving us an increased um, sense of awareness and responsibility to community and to place. And this movement that I was a part of, being a part of, but also a part of leading, a part of leading that movement through spirituality and culture. And in Lakota, we would say this is, uh, you know, the closest sort of transition from what happened to us throughout history from what we started to doing. What in, I guess in English we would say transformation. In Lakota we would say iglu tokcha, which is to make an intervention in how things evolve. And by this, us coming together as a community and as a people and building community-based power and saying no more. We're going to start designing our communities. We're going to start reclaiming our power. We're going to start doing it within the context of the society that we live in today. And this led us to create an organization called Thunder Valley, um, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. And, you know, this was, we started this 10 years ago. Most of us were in our early 20s. Most of us were becoming parents for our first time. And we decided early on that we wanted to create um, an ecosystem of opportunity. That if in our culture we think that everything is related and we acknowledge the interrelatedness of all things, then let's not silo out a bunch of programs. Let's not separate housing from jobs. Let's not separate environment from economic development. Let's not separate youth development from honoring our elders. And so we actually created a, a theory of change here that was called the ecosystem of opportunity. And um, this ecosystem of opportunity is founded on this relationship between people, planet, and prosperity. That's essentially how we've made our development decisions and um, focused on creating a balance between people, planet, and prosperity. That, um, that we have to be balanced in those, in those decision-making processes. If we're gonna create housing in the poorest place in, Amer in America, we're gonna create jobs in the poorest place in America, and we're going to um, protect our ecosystem. And in the ecosystem of opportunity, we have basically have about nine different comprehensive initiatives. One of these initiatives is the Regenerative Community Development Initiative, and it's focused on actually planning and designing an entire community from scratch, a 21st century indigenous community in the poorest place in America. And if we did this from our values, our whole idea was we have to understand that in doing development anywhere in the world, even in the poorest place in America, climate change is a reality, and how we do development can inform other places. So we recognized where we were. We recognized um, where you know that that this was decolonization work that we were doing, but it was also a way to inform the masses about doing regenerative community development. And so, in this community, through a series of community meetings, we engaged the community on Pine Ridge, and we set huge goals for sustainability. If we're going to build this community, we're going to produce 100% of all of our energy that's needed. 
we're going to, um, you're going to have 100% water reclamation. We're going to produce all the food that's needed within a 25 mile radius. We started making all these decisions because we felt that if we didn't make these kinds of decisions, that we would, be, we would begin to, per per to perpetuate the same type of destruction and violence that was been portrayed, portrayed upon us as a people. And so, um, you know, regenerative community development is a priority of our work. Um, housing and home ownership has been a backbone of, our, of that work in engaging poor people to actually own in their communities. It's important for poor people to start owning in our own communities, otherwise we're gonna still um, have terrible relationship. Lakota language, Lakota language is an endangered language. Our average age of a Lakota speaker today is 73 years old. 70% of our Lakota speakers have passed away in the past 10 years, which means that the Lakota language has about 10, or tw tw or 10 to 15 years of life left in it. We have a comprehensive Lakota language initiative that is at this moment right now, one of the only places in Lakota country that's producing Lakota speakers through immersion, through immersion school and immersion programs. Um, workforce development, this is a program that's focused on 18 to 26 year old um, young people in which we engage them in a three tiered program in which they learn how to build sustainable housing. They learn, uh, they're each, each of them are on individual education plans and each of them on life skills programs. Um, we pay them stipends, they learn skills, that equity that in those houses gets passed on to a, another low income family. Again, like the, 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 the idea of an ecosystem. And of course, note, when I say ecosystem, it includes people. This is not an ecosystem that's an environment that's behind this you know, beautiful thing. This is people engaged ecosystem. Food sovereignty, you know, we have three million acres on Pine Ridge. It's the size of Delaware. 97% of our trucks, of our food comes in on trucks. And yet our people suffer from um, diabetes, poor health, poor options. So the, the food sovereignty initiative that we engage is about building the local food systems. And again, each and every one of these things in housing, food systems, all this stuff, it's about uplifting the economy of the people. So we're in the development of local food systems on Pine Ridge. Um, social enterprise. We have a social enterprise initiative that is in the process of creating many different social enterprises. We have all these different programs, but the social enterprise pro, um, initiative is focused on taking those programs, turning them into social enterprises, therefore being able to take them to scale. In our nonprofit side, we have in our nonprofit side, we have a small three-acre demonstration farm that's a poultry-based system. The idea is that's just one unit of production. You could actually take that to scale um, into 30 acres, 300 acres, begin to build a local food system for all of Pine Ridge through social enterprise. Um, youth leadership development. On Pine Ridge, we had a rash, we had a rash, uh, we had a, a rash of suicides that happened over there over a couple years. It became national, national news. And so what we decided to do was start employing young people. Let's start employing young people to solve the problem, rather than all these nonprofits and agencies and organizations sitting around trying to figure out what it is. Let's employ young people. Um, today, Thunder Valley employs close to 60 young, pe young people on an annual basis that provide all kinds of different leadership activities. Um, and they've also begun to meet some of the basic needs. We had no sports for kids at all on Pine Ridge for fifth grade and under. And so what we did was employed the high school kids those high school kids became the coaches and the referees for the kids that were fifth grade to, to kindergarten. And all of a sudden, we, pr we started having all these different activities. But what began to change was mentality. You had kindergarten, first grade, second grade is all of a sudden looking up to their own young people in their own community like they were stars in the NBA, right? So you started having this entire um, evolution. Regional equity. Um, we recognized that we weren't gonna build a planned community behind a fence, that the planned community that we were building is actually a vanguard. It was actually a way to a rallying point. It was a way to engage philanthropy. It was a way to engage federal agencies. And so through our regional equity work, um, we actually became one of the few nations, um, tribal nations, that actually went through a process of creating a regional plan for sustainable development. We actually were a grantee and a partner with the HUD Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities when there used to be one. Um, and 
Um, that actually, that work actually led to our ability to get Pine Ridge designated as a promise zone through the Obama administration. And in the past 48 months, by creating a regional, by creating regional planning and community engagement strategies, we've created some unprecedented partnerships on Pine Ridge that have leveraged close to 50 million new dollars of investment into Pine Ridge in the last, in the last 48 months in the form of water, sewer, roads, infrastructure, youth programming, in increase in educational activities. Um, lastly, art, art and culture has been foundational. We, sh we used to actually not separate art and culture as its own initiative because we just felt like we were doing it. But when we started engaging an advisory committee of our local uh, medicine men, medicine women, artists, interpreters of our culture, different types of performing artists, this began to just totally transform and influence our entire development practices, but it also informed our programming and sort of started changing our whole philosophy um, because we had our interpreters of our culture um, were part of the design process. You know, last week, um, Thunder Valley broke ground for a community center in the development that we're building that was in which our artist advisory council and our culture bearers were some of the fundamental parts of designing that whole facility. Um, so lastly, like why this relates to us, like good for Pine Ridge, right? <laughs> good for us, right? How this relates is we're, we were a bunch of young people, 20, 21, 22 years old, all grew up in either gangs, violence, drugs, and we just decided to make a difference. We decided to do something different. And so when we started to do economic development and planning, we made some pretty big decisions that this is how we were gonna make decisions. That we were gonna make decisions based on people, planet, and prosperity. And if there was too much prosperity and not enough protecting the planet, not, and it wasn't centered on the people, then we wouldn't do it. And it has, we, we haven't turned it into, so we haven't turned it into a, a science yet. It's more of an art than a science at this point. But this decision has led to groundbreaking um, efforts to do this work. And so if a group of young people on Pine Ridge in one of the most poorest places in America can set goals like 100% energy generation, like 100% water reclamation, then my guess, my question is what the hell is everybody else's excuse? <laughs> because we have inner, inner, inner tangled um, generational poverty. I mean, these are huge. I mean, we're, we're unraveling the systems of poverty in the poorest place in America. Also, one of the other big challenges that we have been up against is that less than a half of percent of all philanthropy in America goes to indigenous people in this country. Yet, the wealth that has come from philanthropy in this country was a, has a direct correlation. And so I guess my challenge is that when we're sitting here 20 years from now, that cannot be the same thing. That, cannot, that, that statistic cannot remain. But I don't mean it in a, in a guilt form. What I mean it is that it's a, shared, it's a shared problem. Indigenous people have been part of the shared history of this country, and we should be part of the shared um, equity in this country that we're all trying to receive and fight for. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, two more sort of new, uh, underheard voices here before we sit down and talk and take your questions. Um, and we're going to have Kyle come up next um, from Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Kyle, take it away. November 2000, I was 11 years old and in fifth grade. And my private Christian school was abuzz with the excitement about the new uh, presidential election coming up between George W. Bush and Al Gore. And the administrators at my school decided that a fun way to engage us youngsters in the electoral process would be to hold a straw poll the day before the election at school and to announce the results over the intercom at the end of the day. So the day arrived with much eagerness and anticipation. I remember scribbling 
my chosen candidate on my piece of paper eagerly and bringing it up to my teacher who put it in a box that even said ballot box right on it and bringing it down to the school office. And as we waited for the principal and the secretaries to tally up the vote, we waited with bated breath, our minds wandering far from fractions and Tom Sawyer, until finally, at the end of the day, the voice of my principal rang out through the school. Boys and girls, the results are in. And with 98% of the vote, George W. Bush wins the presidential election at the Pine Ridge Elementary School. There was a smattering of applause and cheers, but more than anything else, there was surprise. I remember looking around at my classmates with shock and seeing my emotion mirrored in their faces until finally someone blurted out the question that was on all of our lips. Only 98%? Who in the world would ever vote for Al Gore? That's one of, of many stories that I could tell you today to give you a glimpse into the conservative evangelical community that raised me. Uh, and I hope you won't judge it too harshly because for all of its flaws and its foibles, just like every community, it was a place of beauty and love and compassion. My Christian education taught me much about pursuing the heart of God, not only for my own sake, but for the sake of the world. My parents loved each other deeply. They loved me and my siblings deeply. They taught us what it was to be people of faith and to live with integrity. But one thing that was conspicuously absent from the community that raised me was any sort of conscious consideration about the relationship between our faith and the impact that we had on the created world around us. Now, my family recycled, but to be honest, if the truck didn't come by every other week to the curb and pick it up, I'm not entirely sure we would have even done that. Faith informed everything in my community when it came to how we lived our lives, from when and where we spent our money to what TV shows and movies we watched. But there was no consideration of how our lives impacted the world around us and what our faith had to say about it. That is at least until years after my elementary school election when my brother came back from a semester abroad in New Zealand and announced to the entire family that he was now a vegetarian. Now it's, it's hard for me to communicate effectively to you just how crazy this sounded to my 17 year old ears. I mean it was as if he had come home and announced that he was now a unicorn. Or, or that his new favorite color was hat. It was completely nonsensical to me. I had no frame of reference for what he was telling me. The only context I had for vegetarians was an imagined group of radicals who spent their time throwing red paint on fur coats and hugging trees and weaving hemp friendship bracelets. But now, my brother's announcement left me with a difficult choice. I could either choose to lump him into that group and write them off or choose to suspend my assumptions and to hear them out. And as you've probably assumed at this point, since I'm standing on this stage, I chose to hear them out. I listened to the books that he read and the professors that he took. I chose to ask my questions and to actually listen to his answers. I chose to be invited into his story of transformation and to, in turn, be transformed myself. And that transformation began to accelerate, accelerate when I headed off to college. Mentors and professors made the connection between Christian practice, climate change, and theology. Service learning trips took me to Appalachia, into the homes of nuns who showered and drank from rainwater that they collected off of their roofs, and into the living rooms of mothers whose 11-year-old daughters had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer because the heavy metals from a mountaintop removal coal mining site nearby had leached into the water supply. I began to understand that caring for the world around me and caring for people was in fact the same thing. Through all of this, it 
became impossible for me to conceive of my faith apart from doing everything that I can to address the impacts of climate change. In other words, I've become a climate activist precisely because of my evangelical faith and not in spite of it. And you might be tempted to think that my story is rather unusual, right? A conservative evangelical turned climate activist. But I'm here to tell you it's not. In fact, my story is profoundly ordinary. The same story that I stand up here telling is written in thousands of places across the United States every day, every year. But if you didn't know that, you can be forgiven. Because they're stories that don't often follow a traditional narrative. Most transformations like mine are not brought about by viewing an inconvenient truth or reading the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're often more subtle, making them difficult to pin down and to say, aha, there's an evangelical who's come to accept climate change. But though they are less predictable, these stories are no less powerful. And when you begin to develop the eyes to see and the ears to hear them, you begin to recognize that these journeys of transformation often share common characteristics. Each of these thousands of stories of conservative evangelicals turned climate activists, while each unique, share commonalities. And they're commonalities that we at Young Evangelicals for Climate Action have come to recognize and are working to leverage in our work of educating and empowering young evangelicals across the country to stand up and take action to address climate change. And we've seen tremendous success so far. Together with our partner organization, the Evangelical Environmental Network, we've mobilized more than three million evangelical Christians across the country to take action on climate change since 2010. Three million. And I want to spend the time that we have left together today sharing my insight into these commonalities, these common threads that weave throughout the story of evangelical transformation when it comes to this issue. Because we at YECA and EEN believe that learning these characteristics and leveraging them effectively is absolutely crucial to moving the political needle in the U.S. on climate change. Because in 2016, white evangelicals comprised only 17% of the population, yet represented 28% of all those who voted in the presidential election. Over the course of the last three presidential elections, 45% of all voters have self-described as pro-life, most of them either evangelical or Catholic. And some of you watching here, some of you here, and, and certainly watching, have committed your lives to mobilizing communities in order to avoid global climate catastrophe, as have I. So I say this to myself as well as to you. The days are long gone when we could simply focus on getting better at preaching to the choir. It hasn't worked. We have to build a bigger choir loft. We have to invite a whole new community to join us, to add new harmonies and layers to our song of climate action. But in order to do this, we have to understand how we can invite these new communities into this work. And, and while there are many things I could talk about today, I want to share just four with you. Sustained evangelical engagement on climate action is built on shared values. It resonates with evangelical moral convictions. It affirms existing identities, and it's rooted in hope. So let's briefly take these in order. First, speaking to the shared values of evangelicals means recognizing and respecting that evangelical worldviews are different than most traditional environmentalist activists. Specifically, evangelical worldviews are deeply formed by a commitment to the authority of Christian scripture and by a deep belief in the sanctity of life. And a conversation with evangelicals about climate change recognizes these values not as deficits to be overcome, but as assets to be leveraged. Let me say that again. A conversation with evangelical Christians about climate change recognizes these values 
not as deficits to be overcome, but as assets to be leveraged. Because building on the evangelical value of the authority of Scripture means using the language of Scripture when we talk about climate change and creation care. And lucky for us, the Bible is chock full of affection for the created world. Genesis 1 says that God looked on all he had made and called it good, not once or twice, but seven times. And right after, in Genesis 2, God takes his image bearers and places them in the garden and tells them to serve and to protect it, according to the original Hebrew. Psalms is filled with God's love for his created world for no other apparent reason except its own intrinsic goodness. Psalm 19, 24, 104, and so many more. And while the cynicism of real politics has driven a wedge between environmental and pro-life values, the truth is that the two are radically united. There is ample scientific evidence now that pollution has adverse impacts on human health, including preterm birth and birth defects. The burning of fossil fuels has been linked to the rapid rise of the four A's in the U.S. Asthma, severe allergies, ADHD, and autism among our children. To be wholeheartedly pro-life, then, has to include advocacy for pristine air, pure water, and a stable climate, which can nurture and sustain all of God's precious children from conception to natural death. Or as we like to put it, creation care is a matter of life. Second, evangelical climate action will resonate with evangelical moral convictions. Now, we know that climate change is disproportionately impacts vulnerable and marginalized people around the world. These are people who have contributed the least to the problem, people with the fewest resources to adapt, and yet are already bearing the brunt of the impacts. This is a moral tragedy that requires a moral response. And yet, you would be shocked at how few evangelicals have heard the issue of climate change framed as a moral or a justice, or a poverty issue. I can point to dozens of young people that I've engaged in my own work who have no idea why they should care about climate change. And when they hear, some for the first time, that climate change isn't just about polar bears and biodiversity, though it is about that, but it's about loving people, they begin to get it. The light bulbs flash on. Acting on climate suddenly becomes about abolishing poverty, about addressing injustice, and helping people around the world flourish. So in order to help people catch this moral vision for climate action, we don't lead with the science. We lead with story. We tell the stories of Christian brothers and sisters around the world and down the street who are being threatened by the impacts of climate change. We lift up the stories of people just like them, of pastors, of church members, of Christian college students who are responding to the reality of climate change with their lives. In Matthew 22, Jesus puts it pretty plainly. He tells his followers that the greatest commandment is to love God and to love our neighbor. And the truth is that responding to climate change is an opportunity to get better at doing both. It's an opportunity to love God better by loving the good world that God loves. It's an opportunity to love our neighbors better by acting to make sure that they have the ability to thrive and to live a life with dignity and respect. And when climate action is framed in this way, it's no longer a laundry list of sacrifices foisted upon evangelicals from distant elites outside their community. It's a moral invitation from the very lips of our Lord and Savior. Love my world. Love my people. It's an invitation to get better at following Jesus. Third, Recognizing and affirming existing identities that are present in the evangelical community means that no one that we engage with feels forced to choose between the communities that give their lives meaning and accepting and acting on climate change. Because far too often, whether it's intended or not, when many evangelicals hear the traditional language of environmentalism and climate change, this is what they hear. 
here are all the reasons that you and your loved ones are wrong. Here are all the reasons we and others that are nothing like you are right. Here are all the ways that you need to radically change the life that you love if you want to be right like us. Doing so will alienate you from every person you know and love, but don't worry because it'll make you more like us and the world will be more like we want it to be. Compelling stuff, huh? Sign me up. <laughs> now, it's a little tongue-in-cheek, it's a little hyperbolic to prove my point, but only slightly. And we know from human psychology and the social sciences that people are deeply driven by emotion and by communal relationships. We are deeply tribal people. And this means that if we're forced to make a choice between belonging to our closest communities or accepting climate science, it's no contest. Our friend Catherine Hayhoe, who's been invoked here already today, uh, an evangelical climate scientist, likes to say that everyone, no matter who they are, already has everything that they need to care about climate change. They just might not know it yet. Political conservatives, libertarians, Second Amendment absolutists, Trump voters, and yes, evangelicals already have everything they need to care about climate change. It's just that most of them have never been told that who they already are could be a climate activist. But when they do hear their identities affirmed and are invited to imagine how they can take action to address climate change by being exactly who they already are, this negative message is flipped on its head. They no longer hear this message, but this message. Here are all the things that you care about and that make your community great. Here are the things that you and those you care about value. Here are all the people just like you who care about the things that you care about, who are taking action to address climate change. And when you join them, you deepen your connections to these people, and the world becomes more like you want it to be. And this kind of message makes all the difference. When somebody at a church hears this from someone in their Bible study or a student can watch a five-minute Facebook video about why someone just like them on another college campus is taking action to address climate change, they suddenly are able to see themselves in the story too and to see taking action not as a threat to their identity but as an identity strengthener. And finally... Effective engagement with evangelicals on climate change will utilize the greatest gift that the church has to offer the world, hope. Now, hope can be a tricky thing, especially when we're talking about climate change, because if all you do is look at the headlines, hope can feel naive, maybe even impossible. But the thing about Christian hope is that it's not ultimately rooted in headlines, but in the bone-deep belief that God has a plan for the world and for his people, and that God will not give up until God's purposes are accomplished. This is a belief that's rooted deep in the bones of evangelical people in the United States. Because we already know that guilt, blame, shame, and doom are lousy motivators for climate action. We have the studies to prove it. The language of hope allows us to avoid them altogether. Instead, we use the language of invitation, of opportunity, faithfulness, and calling. Rather than being guilted and shamed into doing something about climate change, hope can reorient the calculus for evangelicals to make climate action about participating in God's grand work of reconciling the whole creation back to God's self. And acting out of hope brings us closer as evangelicals to the heart of God. Adjusting our lives to live more simply and training our voices to advocate on behalf of poor and vulnerable populations around the world is the way that we practice resurrection living. It's what discipleship to Christ looks like in the 21st century. So does any of this even work? I mean, does this language really resonate with evangelicals in the U.S.? Well, in the less than six years that YECA has been around, we've been able to mobilize over 10,000 young evangelicals across the country to act on climate change. They've marched in the streets. They've prayed and demonstrated at presidential debates. They've lobbied members of Congress. And they've challenged their campuses and their churches to enhance their energy efficiency 
and to increase their use of renewable energy. Friends, this is a community that's ready to join the choir. Trust me. They're ready to make climate change a priority, but only if they can sing the sheet music. If they can see their values reflected in the work, if it connects with their moral convictions, if it affirms their existing identities and helps them see that who they already are is exactly who they need to be to do this, and if it's rooted in hope, then together we can be a part of something truly special, of expanding the choir, of, of adding new harmonies from unlikely allies, and together tackling the, the challenge of climate change once and for all. Thank you. Kyle, thank you. I've got a bunch of questions. I'm sure you guys do too. We're going to hear from one more uh, new voice from uh, Ananda Lee Tan from um, the Climate Justice Alliance before we sit down and take your questions. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. My name is Ananda Lee Tan. I am from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada though the land there is neither British nor Colombian. <laughs> More accurately, it is the unceded territories of the Coast Salish nations, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish, and their many cousins who have governed those lands for thousands of years before colonial rule. My people were immigrants. My own people came over as families from India and China, families that were born out of their own struggles against colonial rule, 300 years of struggle that gave birth to labor organizers, artists, teachers, and revolutionaries. My people were environmentalists, some of the early ones. They were farmers. They organized to overthrow British colonial rule. But in order to do so, they realized that they had to challenge some of the violence embedded in their own historic patriarchies. Today, I hope my son continues in that path. And in my gratitude uh, to those who have gone before us, I also express gratitude to all of you for having brought us here to talk and exchange ideas to our colleagues of, of Candida and WGBH who have invi invited us here to speak. Today, I'm here to represent the Climate Justice Alliance. However, before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge this time. And as Kyle pointed out, uh, we are in a time where we are in a fight to mitigate the sixth greatest extinction, the sixth great extinction, unprecedented biodiversity and species loss around the world caused by human design. We are fighting for the lives of millions of people worldwide who are, faced, who are facing forced displacement, loss of livelihood, hunger and death due to storms, floods and droughts and global resource wars. We are facing an equally significant pub public health crisis caused by the same industries, the dig, burn, drive, dump industries causing climate change. And in addition to these underlying systems of greed, monopoly, and oppression that have perpetuated the growth of these industries, there is a global emergence of the extreme fascist, racist right that is being mobilized to desperately defend these systems, whose cost systems, whose cost burdens have rapidly become too massive for the planet to bear. The election of the 45th president of the United States is just a symptom of this larger, much more complex problem. A problem that requires not only the best of our ability to be systems thinkers, but also the clarity of vision, a strong clarity of vision around why we need to change these complex interwoven systems of oppression. There is a bright side. As an organizer who has spent the past 30 years serving grassroots social movements around the world, I'm here to tell you that some of the most powerful agents of change are right here in this very country. You just heard three of them, three brothers sitting right in front of me whose inspiring stories have really brought me, you know, the hope uh, to carry on the message here today. And there are hundreds of thousands more across this land. You just have to look, look in the right places. It's not that these folks are hidden or hiding in complex, in the complex mosaic of society. It's more likely that they have been somewhat invisibilized by the dominant culture, the dominant narrative in the mainstream media till recent times. 
to see them, understand them, and support them, and collaborate with them, we may have to adjust some, some of how we are seen uh, across, uh, around the world. The issue of equity, as that is the name of this panel, is something I want to briefly touch on, because that's really at the heart of this invisili invisibilization. The difference between equity and equality, as I sometimes put to my friends, is equality has emphasized providing equal opportunity for women, for people of color, for LGBTQI folks. Equi equity, however, requires addressing the historic inequalities that have led to the disparities in power, privilege, and wealth. It requires to ad us to address the systemic discrimination that continues to privilege and center the power of some while pushing others to the margins of society. And that is really at the heart of the change we are trying to organize today. Our communities, communities that the Climate Justice Alliance has started to organize over the last decade, African American communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, black and brown communities, Latinx communities, immigrant communities from around the world, and many poor white communities, are those that are first and most impacted by both the storms, the floods, and the droughts, but also by the extractive, polluting, and in, uh, destructive industries causing this crisis. While these communities are the ones most burdened by the cumulative impacts of pollution, poverty, and police violence that are also interconnected attributes of these colonial industrial systems, and our communities are predominantly still portrayed as victims and sometimes shown as survivors, we have rarely been looked to for what we believe is the long-term vision and deep-rooted knowledge necessary to bail the world out of this complex crisis we are mired in. Our communities are not only at the front lines of these crises, but since 1492 on these lands have been at the forefront of the resistance, the resilience, and the struggles for transformative change. We have been cultivating real solutions in our communities, and I hope to uh, briefly present some of those to you today. For the solutions in our communities are rooted in a knowledge of the caring capacity of the earth, are rooted in practices enshrined in ancient cultures of respect and care, strategies that are guided by principles of democratic self-governance, and solutions that are informed by holistic understanding of how we must learn to walk in humility and in synchronicity with the natural systems that sustain us. So who are our communities? As I said, we are black and brown communities, indigenous communities, working class communities across the, across the country. We are communities that to this day are places where toxic industrial facilities continue to be cited, like coal power plants, waste incinerators, and oil refineries, disproportionately so cited in our backyards. We are communities that are resource poor, but able to organize ourselves in many beautiful and powerful ways, ways that have allowed us to overcome the most powerful polluting corporations in our own backyards. And oftentimes, while we have watched billions of dollars of philanthropic support flow by to environmental policy campaigns in DC, run by a very large national NGOs that have eventually failed, uh, these communities, resource poor communities, have really prevented the vast pollution and carbon loads that have been threatened our existence. We've prevented over 150 coal power plants from coming over bo board that were part of the Bush Energy Plan. We pr we've prevented four to 500 waste incinerators from being built in communities across the US. We've prevented, in recent years, the expansion of oil refineries, oil refineries being built by Chevron, Exxon, and others to, to process dirtier uh, crude from places like the Alberta tar sands. In fact, according to legal advisors, of the world's most polluting energy and waste corporations, the biggest hurdle to citing a dirty energy facility like a coal plant or incinerator today is the opposition from our movement, a movement that has been born out of you know, roots of diverse cultures of resistance. We've been able to take on and defeat some of these large, wealthy, and powerful corporations in our own backyards because we can organize power in our communities in ways that prevent the influence and control, uh, their influence and control over our local governments. In, in the policy beltways, these multinational corporations will always have more influence than civil society, but not so in our communities. Our movements are intergenerational and they have to be. That is a key attribute of our movements. 
because as intergenerational movements, our grandparents are looked upon to instruct our grandkids. Uh, and a few core lessons that they instruct them with to start is to understand that the direction in which our movements need to grow have to be informed by where we have come from. A core practice of the environmental justice movement is to acknowledge the guidance of those that have walked before us and the values and principles that they have espoused. These values and principles are what have allowed our movements to build the trust necessary to sustain both our commitment and scale out our power across, across the landscape. These values and principles have been shared, as I said before, across many diverse languages and cultures and have had a common basis of compassion and care stemming from our primary relationship with the earth. I was really, uh, uh, my heart was warm to hear some of the presentations yesterday about uh, the importance of nature for the cultivation of our children's futures. Because for us, uh, to heal ourselves of the multiple layers of oppression uh, brought on to us by colonial extractivist industries, we've had to commit ourselves to the freedom and well-being of all the Earth's children. In simple terms, and I think Nick referred to this earlier, decolonization is the process by which we restore our relationships to the Earth and to each other. We have to start by decolonizing our minds. So Climate Justice Alliance was an effort to bring all these communities of practice together about a decade ago. It was a renewed effort to create a national platform for thousands of environmental justice communities, their organizing networks, alliances, and movement support organizations that serve them. We started this process of alignment in 2007, holding meetings and assemblies with frontline communities across the country. We aligned our efforts using the 17 environmental justice principles that were first art articulated in 1991 at the first People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, and then the Jemez principles of democratic organizing that were articulated in tandem with national environmental organizations and human rights organizations in the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico in 1996. Over the course of five years and hundreds of meetings, we finally agreed to the name Climate Justice Alliance at a national assembly in Richmond, California, with a shared purpose as a national alliance of frontline communities to organize a just transition away from the dig, burn, drive, dump economy and towards localized economies that prioritize care for people and planet. So what is a just transition? Simply put, just transition is a historic, dynamic, and evolving discourse between the labor movement and the environmental justice movement on how do we organize the phase out of industries that are causing the most harm to communities, workers, our health, and ecosystem health around us. With the need to build economic alternatives rooted in community, rooted in self-determination, with concrete pathways for workers and their families to access sustainable livelihoods. We have started our work with many members of the labor movement, including groups like visionary groups like the Labor Network for Sustainability, to organize political power between our communities and these unions that live next to us on the front lines of change. Moving away from a jobs or the environment framework to a jobs for the environment framework. Busting that false binary of jobs versus environment while phasing out harm and addressing real community needs. We believe that we'll be able to do this if we provide the visionary pathways for both community self-determination, but also deep democracy. In organizing communities to believe that they can be the de not only the determinants, but the designers of their own future. This transition is a move away, like I said, from this dig, burn, drive, dump economy, facets of what we are many call the extractive economy an economy that extracts both human and natural resources and processes these resources uh, through very highly inefficient but more exploitative systems and then dumps them, wastes these resources and uh, into landfills, burn facilities, prisons, uh, and you know, poverty around the country. To successfully move away from this industrial paradigm, we must realize that to both detoxify and decarbonize our economic systems, we also need to move away from the banks and tanks economy that is 
are pivotal features of, this, uh, of these systems. So the banks and tanks economy where the global exploitation of human and natural resources are enforced by a military industrial complex and supported to serve the enclosure of wealth and power in the hands of a few. We also need to pro provide a vision of the alternative. A, a just transition has to be guided by a vision of local living and interwoven economies for life that are critical, that provide critical life support mechanisms such as public transportation, community energy, local healthy food systems, zero waste systems, responsible resource use and materials production design, community housing, healthcare for all, ecological restoration, and a space for evolving arts and culture. There are principles we have developed to guide our work. And like I said before, these principles aren't new principles. They're principles that our elders and those that have walked before us have passed on. Principles that were originally developed in this world by labor unions and environmental justice groups in the 80s and 90s, thought leaders from the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union, the Communication, Energy and Paper Workers Union, the Indigenous Environmental Network, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, the Southern Network for Environment and Economic Justice, and many others who formed our first Just Transition Alliance. What it has evolved into today is work in Indian country, in Black Mesa, work led by members of the Navajo and Hopi nations who have formed the Black Mesa Water Coalition to move away from coal to the enormous solar energy potential on their lands, guided by principles of energy democracy where they self-determined the use of the local energy and water and other resources. Members of the Black Mesa Water Coalition have organized their tribal communities, but also allies to really understand that in this time, we need democratic self-governance of these resources, not only to provide the livelihoods uh, you know, that will lead their uh, communities out of poverty, but also you know, around the design of a whole ecosystem narrative. A narrative that uh, at some point in time, and I would encourage folks to look at one of the stories I learned the first time I supported some of my sisters and brothers there was a story of Mother Earth's liver. Why coal is not only dangerous to us above ground or in the atmosphere, but how coal pr uh, provides an essential bodily function for the bowels of the earth in processing and filtering our waters. We also work with communities in the south uh, and in the Midwest. Communities like the East Michigan Environmental Action Coalition who have been fighting for food justice and water rights in a community where there are more smokestacks uh, in Detroit, in one of the most uh, black dominated communities in the country where the disproportionate burdens of pollution really come to light with the number of smokestacks embedded in these communities. The largest waste incinerator in the US, the largest uh, expansion of oil refinery production in the US, one of the dirtiest coal power plants in the US, all leading to, like I think what Kyle mentioned with the four A's, but levels of asthma and respiratory il illness amongst children that are amongst the top 10 um, of any communities in the world. Groups like the East Michigan Action uh, Council have been organizing their youth in ways that make our resistance irresistible and our movements beautiful. They have brought together workers and communities to really look at the industrial systems like burning waste that makes so, no sense, but also uh, in efforts to shut them down what where, we, we, where we realize the potential of generating more jobs mm -hmm. per tonnage of waste than all the dig, burn, dump systems currently provide. Where 10 times the number of jobs per tonnage of waste that go to landfills and incinerators could be created through resource recovery systems, local jobs that could provide good union wages. This was the first time that the Teamsters Union, who represent the dump truck drivers, had marched with black and brown communities in the city of Detroit because they started, have started to believe in this narrative that we could not only alleviate pollution burdens that were destroying the health of, health of our children, but also create more jobs through, through these new economic models. And also, as I said before, we're working in parts of the South where black liberation has intersected with issues of poverty <coughs> and economic self-determination and what the members of Cooperation Jackson call building a solidarity economy. 
some of the exciting work there has involved building political power. And folks may have heard in, in this summer, they've elected a mayor who have emer has emerged from this movement, the Malcolm X grassroots movement and movements uh, in, in, in Mississippi that now is a champion for this in intersection of both earth rights, but community rights, but the rights of black workers to form cooperative economies that determine the economic futures of their community. Building a solidarity economy for them has involved not only charting the paths for their economy, but doing so with neighboring communities in the South. Communities in, across Mississippi, in Alabama, communities that have traditionally organized farming cooperatives and many other expressions of economic self-determination. Their building has involved not only local organizing, but building with communities around the country, like communities in Barcelona, Catalan, and and Mondragon in Basque Country, where worker cooperatives are leading the way in designing new economies for the future. So these are just a few examples, three examples of communities in our network. And we're working with 60 more, and we hope in the coming years that there will be hundreds. Communities where solidarity is not just uh, a matter of economic support, between community, from community to community, but solidarity involves a vision of economic uh, economies, translocal economies, built, owned, controlled by workers, and inherent to that is that we, in expressing common cause and kinship with those facing and fighting similar systems of oppression, we are also taking action to match those expressions of common cause uh, at the National uh, Assembly of the Climate Justice Alliance, uh, last spring, representatives of over 100 communities, organizations, and alliances made plans to show up for our sisters and brothers protecting their water and land rights in Standing Rock. And while doing so, we continue to espouse that these multiple stories of inspiring communities are the basis of how we intend to organize economies to serve our future health and well-being of, of the entirety of uh, people on this planet. At the core of this story is our belief in new technologies that massive investments in new technologies or capital intensive sustainable development schemes devised by a cadre of global elite is not what is gonna deliver us out of the current crisis. We believe that it is our original instructions from our cultures and communities and our historic path that can provide us the solutions right in our own backyards. We simply need to lift up these stories and share them with other communities around the world in ways that which you are doing here. A horizontal sharing that overcomes the barriers of privilege, power, and access. To build bridges of solidarity between the systemic divides that have been created to exploit both rural and urban communities, oppress and racialized both communities of color and white communities, colonized and assimilated both indigenous and settler communities around, across the land, and to disconnect the have-nots in communities in the global south and the north. In trying to do so, we've been working with three other international alliances, the Indigenous Environmental Network, the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, and the Rights to the City Alliance. Our new global formation, It Takes Roots, is presently at the UN Climate Conference in Bonn, challenging US and international policymakers to align directives of the Paris Accord with real community-centered solutions. We're also organizing solidarity brigades at present, and that's where the rest of our staff team is, to support our sisters and brothers in Puerto Rico who have been slammed by the recent waves of destruction brought on by Harvey, Irma, and Maria. This week, organizers and skilled technicians from Houston, Brooklyn, New Orleans, Miami, and many other coastal communities experienced in post-hurricane recovery work are sailing to Puerto Rico on a ship provided by Greenpeace, the Arctic Sunrise, to support our members in Puerto Rico for a just recovery and rebuild. Where a large swath of colonial Puerto Rico remains without electricity, potable water, adequate healthcare and food systems, these solidarity brigades are also transporting critical supplies such as building materials, farming tools and renewable energy equipments to support the construction of distributed solar, water and wind energy across the island. Core to this work, we believe, is that we need to, just as we need to restore our relationships to the earth and each other, this work requires long-term commitments to both act 
in such solidarity, turning thought to action in the defense of each other's communities, but also to collaborate in building the political long-term power that poses the countervailing force needed to stop the corporate powers destroying this earth. We welcome you to join us, and uh, I don't have any cards, so if you want to get in touch with me, my email's up on the, uh, on the slide there. Thank you very much.